Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, Bob, for that splendid introduction. As you said, this is a Rutherford Appleton Laboratory Lecture. So in the spirit of a research laboratory, this talk is also going to be a bit of an experiment. My name is Victoria Marshall, that's me, top left, with some very illustrious company, and I've worked at Rutherford for more than 30 years. I'm one of three main speakers today who are going to tell you the story of how one very imaginative and inventive man did something that no one had ever done before and helped change the way in which the world thought about computers. Hopefully the Zoom technology will stand up, but whatever happens, it's not going to be your usual sort of RAL lecture. I shall begin our story by explaining that at the start of the 1960s, computers were just big calculating machines. They were the size of a house, cost millions to buy, and you needed to be a real technical boffin to use them. They were good for number crunching and handling stock inventory, but that was about it. But 1968 was a very exciting year. In 2001, a space oddity, od odyssey had premiered. The Vietnam War was raging. Robert Kennedy was shot at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. And Doug Engelbart demonstrated for the first time the use of a computer mouse and hypertext. Also in 1968, a group of four people, Yasha Reichart, an attic art critic and curator, Francisca Themerson, an illustrator and stage designer, together with Mark Dowson and Peter Schmidt as technical advisors, staged an international exhibition at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London. The exhibition was called Cybernetic Serendipity and featured the work of over 130 composers, engineers, artists, mathematicians and poets. It was intended to demonstrate all aspects of computer-aided creative activity and show possibilities rather than achievements because computers hadn't yet revolutionised the arts to the same extent in which they were revolutionising science. All of the exhibits in the show were produced using a cybernetic device or were in themselves cybernetic devices. This is one view of the exhibition and in the foreground we can see Sam, the sound activated mobile. Sam is a column of aluminium castings that looking a bit like vertebrae with a flower like fiberglass reflector on the top plus four small microphones. There are miniature hydraulic pistons which enable the column to twist and bend and lean so as to follow any sound in the room. And there were stories of visitors to the exhibition talking at it and walking around it and shouting at it, seeing how it responded. This is another view of the exhibition. This is Colloquy of Mobiles by Gordon Pask. This is larger than life mobiles hanging from the ceiling, which use lights and mirrors to communicate with each other and they rotated and blinked and squawked among themselves. Visitors could walk amongst the mobiles, blocking the interactions, or even use a torch to attract their attention and get in on the conversation. There was also music, either compositions created by computers or sounds generated by them. One of these compositions was January Tension by Peter Zinoviev of synthesizer fame that was composed and performed entirely using a PDP-8 computer, as we could just about see in this photo. Another composition was cartridge music by John Cage, who prepared instruments attached to the cartridges of phonographic pickups and is now a classic of electronic music. The exhibition in London ran from August to October and then toured cities in, in the States and Canada. It was seen by over 60,000 visitors, including Bob Hopgood, who's sitting in on this talk, and Princess Margaret, pictured here with Bruce Lacey, a British, British artist and performer. One of the exhibits at Cybernetic Serendipity was a little animated film called The Flexipede. It's only two minutes long, and by modern standards, it's very simple. But what makes it special is that it is arguably the world's first film featuring a computer animated character. So I'm about to play it for you. So here we go. 
made in 1967, the Flexipede. Flexipede was created by this man, Anthony George Melvin Pritchett, although everyone called him Tony. Tony was a lovely, very modest guy living in London at the time, who sort of fell into animation and sort of fell into computer programming come to that. Tony had taken a job at London University's computer centre in Gordon Square, where they had a Ferranti Atlas One computer. This is the smaller sibling of the one next to the Rutherford lab. And it took about six months for Tony to write the Flexipede program in Fortran 5. As, as you've just seen, however, the film also required graphical output, which wasn't part of Fortran at the time. So Tony managed to incorporate a graphics library written by Paul Nelson at the Atlas Lab. And we'll hear more about that later. When Tony ran his program on the London Atlas, that produced a magnetic tape of instructions which he then took to Cullum Laboratory near Abingdon in Oxfordshire. The magnetic tapes were then loaded onto the Benson Lehner microfilm recorder and that produced 16 millimeter camera film. That was then developed and then could be viewed on a reel to reel projector as one did in those days. And as you've heard, Tony later also added a soundtrack using odd bits of furniture and things he found around the house. But on with our story. Tony and Kate met by accident. Over to you, Kate. Uh, thank you, Victoria. And um, hello, everyone. Thank you uh, for coming along today. Uh, it's really great to be able to share some of Tony Pritchett's work with you. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen uh, to begin with. And uh, Okay, hopefully you can see this. Right, so here we have uh, Tony Pritchett, uh, animator and programmer, of course, and uh, he was working at, at a really, really exciting time in computer and film and uh, animation history. Uh, and he was also a really good storyteller and um, it's my aim today to share some of his stories with you but uh, first I just want to begin by very quickly telling you a little bit about how I came to meet him uh, in the first place and that was here at St Martin's College of Art in London 
Now, inside this building was a huge, uh, great big concourse, huge, great big concrete thing, which I've drawn uh, a diagram of in the style of the flexipede. And uh, so imagine, uh, if you will, screen right, we have a door to a character animation student event that I'd been invited to. And screen left, we have a door to a retrospective. Now, I'm not actually sure whose work was on display that day. I, I'm, uh, apologies to the artist, whoever you are. You see, I never actually got to reach the retrospective because I met someone who was wandering off from it. And that, of course, was Tony Pritchett. And uh, we quickly established that we were both animators. And um, he asked me if I'd like to watch a film he'd watched on his iPod. And um, I must add here, of course, he did this in a typically modest Tony Pritchett way, a sort of mixture of enthusiasm and modesty that uh, he quite often had. Anyway, of course, I wanted to watch his film and I pressed play. So my goodness, there was just so much that I liked about uh, the Flexipede. Um, it was digital, but it was also uh, an analog film. It was, it was a 16 millimeter print with a lovely analog soundtrack. And uh, <clears throat> it was almost sort of cave painting like. I thought, I thought, gosh, this looks almost like a sort of, sort of great, great, great ancestor of one of my silly um, computer cartoon characters. And then I actually later worked out that the Flexipede uh, arguably is the world's first um, computer generated cartoon cartoon character and uh, I say arguably because of this film here. Now this as many of you may know is Michael Knowles computer ballet created two years before Flexipede in 1965 uh, over in the states at Bell Labs and uh, in incredible um, in technical achievement that it is. Uh, the, th the thing is, is I would say personally this is more motion graphics than character animation. So what do I mean by this? Well if we look again at the flexipede tony's created a, a cartoon character that's that seems sort of sentient you know it seems to be alive uh, flexipede is reacting to its to its environment and marvelous as it is I'm, I'm not sure you can quite say the same thing about the characters in Noel's computer ballet and um uh, just moving on here. Um, also on the subjects of, of first, um, I would I would also argue that the flex in the flexipede we see the world's first uh, comedy performance in a computer generated film. Um, it's not it's not a, you know it's not a hilarious film. It hasn't got a great big punchline at the end, but you know it is full of whimsicality, and. Um, and if I just show you this here, finally, it's a story. It's not a complicated story, but it does have a clearly defined beginning, middle and end. And I, again, I would say, do you know what? In fact, I would argue that this is the world's first computer animated story. And uh, just importantly to add here that Tony didn't seem that fussed himself about claiming such grandiose things. Uh, I got the impression he was very proud of his work, but at the same time, he was an incredibly modest man. Uh, and uh, goodness knows what he'd think about, about us talking about him today. I expect he'd be, uh, you know, talking, wanting to butt in and talk about someone else's work, I expect, but who knows? Uh, anyway, um, uh, I'm just moving on, hang on a sec. Um, and, and I just just want to also add here that, that Tony seemed on the subject of comedy, he, he, he was quite amused by the lengths that he went to uh, to create Flexipede, uh, at least in retrospect anyway. And, um, uh, you know, because because on the surface, as Victoria mentioned, it is quite a simple looking cartoon. But David will be delving into the technical depths of all that later on, uh, what, what Tony actually actually did have to do in, in order to achieve his film. So that's the sort of Z depth of the talk, if you will. But back to my X, Y story for now. And um, I asked Tony if I could see some more of his work. Uh, and, and luckily for me, he said yes. And uh, so a few weeks later, I, I, I was very lucky to get to visit uh, the Tony Pritchett archive. And um, this was a wonderful world of uh, lesser documented early UK computer animation. And it was all stored in a box room in Tony's uh, house in North London. And um, one of the boxes that I've, I've uh, selected to, to show to you today uh, is this one here. And uh, in it is a folder labelled Alien Autodoc. 
And uh, this, this uh, project folder refers to um, some graphics here that Tony created at Rao. And uh, the, the finished graphic was used in um, Ridley Scott's Alien, 1979, but uh, the graphics were actually created at Rao between 1977 and 1978. And uh, I'm just going to give you, show you a clip now of them in situ in Alien, 1979. Disengage. They're so shown very quickly there, blue can you miss it? They're shown again. They are shown a couple of times in the film. And uh, they're also shown again in Blade Runner in 1982. Because, uh, let's turn this volume down a bit. Ridley Scott liked them so much, he used them twice. And here we see them in Blade Runner on a monitor on one of, on one of the flying cars. I believe you call these spinners. But these, these feature a fair bit in the film. So there we go. Uh, so um, what I want to do now is do a little experiment. As, as Victoria said, we're at Rao, so this is the kind of thing we should be doing. I'm going to attempt to overlay the evolution of this graphic uh, from, from doodle to finished thing over the following description of the archive in the box room. So here we go. Here's my experiment. Hopefully I won't blow you all up. Uh, so... Uh, <clears throat> So the Tony Pritchard archive contained computer graphics and related materials dating from around 1963 to 1983. So that's 20 years of uh, evolving graphics and the technology that was uh, used to make them. And um, some of my uh, friends also, and colleagues also visited the archive and they had pretty much the same reaction as me. It was blinking marvellous. And um, one of the great things about the archive was that Tony created folders for each of his projects that he worked on. And um, because he worked alone or, or as part of a, quite a small, a relatively small scale team, these folders would contain an overview of the whole production process. So, for, for example, you know, you'd get budget notes in there, you'd get correspondence, uh, you'd get materials relating to design and animation and, of course, programming. And... Um, and it was just, it was just marvellous. Just, you know, Tony was taking on all these different roles. He'd even sometimes take on the role of, as, of runner, uh, c c collecting the rushes. Here we got some rushes from Alien. It's all very urgent. And, um, but, um, oh, I must show you this, actually. This, this, uh, this is, this is a little um, kind of frame of film. Quite often film in the archive uh, would, would, would kind of con contain a little, a little, tag which would tell you all about the technology that that was exported from and this frame here if you look sort of bottom left you see things and um, I just wanted to show this to you today because things was actually uh, some graphics software created by David Juice and Bob Hopgood um, and things stands for Fortran Interactive Noddy Graphics System obviously, and uh, of course it does. But um, enough of this for now, I'm gonna undock from these alien graphics um, because I want to show you this. And um, this, is, uh, this is a slightly atypical folder in the archive uh, because this predates Tony's interest in computer animation. Uh, this is uh, full of work relating to his job as production uh, assistant at the BBC, uh, which began in 1965, but most of the contents from this folder uh, is from 1966. And um, at the BBC, Tony was working, as I say, as a production assistant on um, educational programmes for children. And um, I just want to add a little comment line here to say this was a great interest of Tony's. He was very interested in the use of uh, television for education. And um, anyway, so. This is 1966. Back in 1966, um, you, you know, you, you'd want to be using some graphics in your in your television programs for kids, but 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 unfortunately, there weren't any computers in the graphics department. Uh, in, in fact, there weren't any computers in the entire BBC. So, um, what did the BBC use to create their television graphics? Well, they used cardboard, and um, this is, a, is, a, is called a Wormser, uh, named after its inventor, Alfred Wormser. And um, these things were filmed live on set, and uh, high-tech ones had butterfly clips. 
And uh, here we have a great worm zoo. This actually features a picture of Tony, um, <laughs> painted bright white and um, pretending to be a computer uh, in a series of shows with the most amazing title in the world, Mathematics in Action. And um, uh, uh, sorry, I've just got to get my script here. And uh, it just so happened that um, the presenter uh, uh, on this on this on this series of programmes uh, was was Dr. Benedict Nixon. Now. Um, Dr. Nixon wasn't a professional television presenter. Uh, he was, in fact, a computer scientist working at the Institute of Computer Science in London. And um, I'm sure uh, quite a few of you know that this was home to two floors worth of Atlas supercomputer, the most powerful or one of the most powerful um, computers in the world at that time. And uh, unfortunately, oh, I'll just show you some pictures of Atlas. There we go. So this, this, this computer was over two floors, for those of you don't, that don't know. This was, this was kind of uh, the ground floor. Let me go into the basement here, where you got even more Atlas. It was a huge, great big thing. Uh, but uh, So I've got these pictures of Atlas, but I don't have any pictures of Dr. Nixon, unfortunately. Tony and I couldn't find any. Tony said he looked a bit like William Hartnell's Doctor Who. So there we go. There's my placeholder for now. Um, so anyway, uh, Dr. Nixon apparently, in Tony's words, fed Tony articles on um, computer animation and in Tony's words got him really fired up about the about the idea of the possibility of of using computers for animation this is something that's Tony just suddenly thought you know this is this is really interesting I, I want to pursue this and uh, in June 1966 Dr. Nixon wrote uh, to the powers that be at the Institute of Computer Science and um, he, he manages to get Tony uh, some funding and access to the Atlas in order to um, make, uh, A, uh, make instructional films suitable as adjuncts to courses in computer science and B, to investigate the use of computers for the production of animated film. And uh, pretty much a year later, in July 1967, uh, Tony writes a memo uh, mentioning that uh, A didn't quite come off due to grants cuts, so he's going to go and get on with B and proceed to investigate the use of computers for the production of animated film. So uh, that's the end of my story for now, that's the end of part one. And I'm just going to stop sharing here, hopefully, if I can find my cursor. Oh dear, where's my cursor gone? Oh, bear with me a minute. Oh, where's my cursor gone? I've got a computer error here, guys. I actually can't see my cursor. Hang on a sec. There we go. <sighs> Computers, eh? I think you're next, Victoria. Yeah, sorry, Victoria, go for it. It's just getting organised. Uh, visitors to RAL will have seen the building opposite main reception. It doesn't look very prepossessing, but when it was built in the 1960s, it was in its way pretty revolutionary thanks to its director, Jack Howlett. This was the Atlas Computer Laboratory, sandwiched between Harwell to the north, which is behind the building as we look at it, and Rutherford to the south, which is sort of on the right. The Atlas Computer Laboratory was built for and named after its first occupant, the Ferranti Atlas I computer, which had been designed by Tom Kilburn at the Electrical Engineering Department of Manchester University and built by Ferranti Limited, also based in Manchester. In its day, the Chiltern Atlas, as it was known, was the biggest, fastest, most powerful general purpose programmable supercomputer in the world. And when it was switched on, it was said to have doubled Britain's computational resources. Like the Atlas in London, it filled two floors of the building and ran a compute service for scientists at Harwell and Rutherford, universities across the country, and institutes, including CERN and the Met Office. Only three Atlas I computers were ever built, but at £3 million each, that probably wasn't surprising. I was also interested to note that the cost of constructing the building that it went into was only about a tenth of the cost of the machine in the first place, which just shows you 
how incredibly expensive these things were. We are very lucky in that we a large archive of artifacts, manuals, papers and photographs still exist. These have been curated by Bob Hopgood as part of the Children Computing Archive website, assisted by me. So what follows is a selection of photographs of just some of the artifacts we have. One thing they don't tell you when you set up a website like this is the huge variety of queries that you get. Anything from people trying to track down old colleagues, authors and journalists wanting to verify something, Wikipedia asking permission to use a photo, or as happened last year, someone saying, I've got this drawer of punch cards labeled Flexipede. What on earth do I do with it? You also get to hear some wonderful stories. How part of the Atlas Lab very nearly featured in a 2001 A Space Odyssey. What happens when a delegation of users unexpectedly turns up with a fabulous thank you gift? And what happened late one night when a Second World War officer from the Canadian Air Force walked past the operations room window and vanished through the wall? And of course, you get to meet some fascinating people. Engineers from back in the day telling you how they, about how they looked after these machines. Film directors doing research and operators explaining how they dealt with huge lengths of fragile paper tape which had been dropped on the floor and unwound. And that very high staircase came in handy, I, I gather, at this point. About four and a half years ago, in February 2016, one of our visitors was Tony Pritchard. Tony had come to the Atlas Lab in the 70s to do some work for the Open University, so he was delighted to revisit his old stomping ground and meet up again with Bob. Tony brought Kate with him because she was making her documentary about him at the time. And with a shout out to our CCS friends, Dick Leatherdale came along too. He's second right in this photo. Dick is editor of one of the British Computer Society specialist journals, Resurrection. He was an Atlas programmer back in the day in the computer centre in Gordon Square, so knew Tony well. Here were Tony and Kate trying to orient themselves outside the think room in the Atlas building which was also known as the Goldfish Bowl with three glass walls. And that is now the break area above what's known as the Atlas Atrium. Of course, we had to go and visit Atlas in storage and a jolly good time was had by all, except perhaps by Nigel at the back here, who spent all day carrying around a very heavy video camera. Sadly, Tony died rather suddenly about 18 months later. Needless to say, we're very upset at that, especially Kate, who'd got to know him well. Kate continues our story. Thank you, Victoria. And uh, so I will just uh, share my screen with you guys again. Okay. Uh, one sec. Right, so uh, just to recap, um, it's July 1967 and Tony is all set to investigate the use of computers for the production of animated film. And uh, he's been chatting to his friend Raz Riddle. And uh, Raz has been reading a uh, story about a mountain walker alone apart from his faithful soliped. And um, both Raz and Tony liked, as Raz puts it, frivoling about with language. And um, they come up with the word flexipede from the word solipede. And uh, so that was the name sorted. And uh, uh, Tony didn't recall uh, creating um, a storyboard or, or a script for his film, but he did create uh, one of his project folders. And uh, here we see the Flexipede project folder. And um, as we look through um, some of the images in this folder, I just want to um, remind you that Tony would have been creating his animation without the use of a monitor. And this, this, this wasn't some sort of like daredevil, showy, artistic uh, thing that he was doing. Uh, Atlas didn't have a monitor. So um, the only uh, clue he would had uh, as to whether or not his programming was going okay would have been uh, printouts, uh, listings, these are printouts 
formats of the programme for those of you that don't know, and also plotter prints, which are effectively uh, 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 pen plotter uh, drawings. Uh, unfortunately, there aren't any pen plotter drawings in the archive, um, but there is plenty of uh, uh, paper here from the from the um, from the ICS. Um, and um, of course, he would have he would have been creating his his program using punch cards. Dave is going to be going into much more detail about that later on. But um, just to say for now that um, you know he'd be go he'd be going uh, up and down stairs at the Institute of Computer Science, debugging his film, uh, writing and rewriting, repunching these cards, uh, throwing away old ones, putting in new ones, trying not to mix the whole lot up. And uh, uh, this was this was quite a lengthy process by by today's standards and um, as well as doing a lot of walking he would have been doing a lot of waiting because of course he didn't actually operate Atlas himself he would have handed in his punch cards at reception and then these would have um, been put into a pigeonhole and he would have waited until uh, there was an opportunity for his program to be run and he told me that quite often this was overnight so again you know I mean time is really ticking on uh, uh, making this two minutes cartoon and um, so it's not July anymore it's 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 now um, the 7th of the 10th 67 I don't know if you can see that um, on these listings here of course uh, dates is one of the great thing that thing that these listings are great for we see a date here uh, the 7th of um, October and um, here we have Tony uh, waiting um, he stood here uh, on the gallery, the viewing gallery, I should say, at the Institute of Computer Science. And um, here he's, uh, he's not waiting uh, for a plot of plotter prints or listing prints this time. This time he's waiting for a half inch magnetic tape. And um, while we're waiting for this for this tape, I just want to tell you that on screen right here is Dick Leatherdale, Computer Conservation Society's Dick Leatherdale. He's only 19 here, ah, and he's on works experience, but there he is. And here he is again, this time he stood in front of a cheese plant and a clock and he's illustrating um, uh, an, an, another, uh, another project that uh, Tony was working on at the Institute at the, at the time. And that was all to do with coalescence and the hidden line problem. And that is the cleverest joke of my entire talk. But don't applaud me, applaud Tony, because he's got his ma magnetic tape and he's now onto the next stage of his animation project. Uh, so, uh, now, uh, what I need to tell you about this tape is that it, it contains some additional subroutines. Now, subroutines, these are basically instructions that are going to um, allow the flexipede to walk off the magnetic tape onto 16 millimeter film via a thing called a microfilm recorder. I'm sure many of you in the audience already know exactly what's happening here, but just for some of my friends that I've invited, um, basically, um, I'm not going to describe to you what a microfilm recorder is, but I'm going to tell you that he, David will be doing that later. Uh, but he's going to be, he basically, Tony needs access to one, let's just put it that way. And um, unfortunately, the ICS don't have one. Um, older Marston do, they have an SC4020, and uh, later they replace that with an SC4060. But you see, the thing is, is that Tony's not going to get anywhere near those, uh, because basically the folks at Older Marston, um, don't really want to make cartoons. They're too busy making atomic bombs. And um, that's Bob Hopgood's joke, by the way. If anyone at Older Marston's watching, blame him. But seriously, Older Marston was, there was extreme high security there. Bob told me that he worked there for at least a year and he didn't really get very close to any of the equipment. So Tony was not going to get to make a two minute cartoon uh, about a caterpillar on one of those. And, and he couldn't use the SC4020 at RAL either, because unfortunately, even though Bob had uh, done his three years of waiting for, to, for it to arrive, it, it, at that point in time, when Tony needed it, it wasn't being uh, rented out. Uh, but Tony is going to get to use the BL120 right now. This is, this is brilliant that he gets to use this, um, and quite unlikely, because it actually belongs to... Uh, the um, UK Atomic Energy Authority's Fusion Research Lab, and uh, but they, you know, they're, they're going to let him make his cartoon using it. And um, 
but the thing is, is it's in Oxfordshire. So Tony uh, grabs his tape, he gets in his uh, Beetle car, and he drives up to Cullum in Oxfordshire to use this BL120. Uh, he walks up to another reception. This time I do have a picture of reception. This is uh, not a photo that Tony's taken. It's actually a frame of film, a shot in 1967 of Cullum Lab. I'm not sure who this uh, woman is, I'm afraid, but she's, she's, um, she'd be in the sort of place that Tony's car, uh, uh, half inch tape would have been handed into. Uh, so he does a lot of waiting again. Eventually, he gets back some 16 millimeter film uh, containing the Flexipede animation. Now, remember, as I was saying earlier, that the Atlas didn't have a monitor. So this would have been the first time that Tony was able to see all his frames and them all playing at 24 frames per second. And unsurprisingly, errors were revealed. And um, Tony told me that he actually drove up to Cullum and back several times to debug his film. But debug it, he did. And um, eventually, uh, sometime, uh, date, exact date unknown, Tony leaves Cullum Lab with his uh, half inch magnetic tape and his 16 millimeter film of the Flexipede. But he's not finished yet. He still has to add a soundtrack and titles. David's going to tell you about the soundtrack. As for the titles, he does those uh, using Letraset. And um, he does that because he's going to be saving Atlas a lot of drawing time. If you look at the Flexipede titles, they have a kind of quite nice little curve to them. Very nice uh, typeface there. Uh, Futura display, if anyone's interested. And uh, it's lovely, but uh, much easier to do using Letraset. Although, poor old Tony still has to debug those. Here we have a fly <laughs> that's landed on the Letraset. Uh, but eventually, 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 Tony does manage to finish his film. The date is now 1812, 1967. So that's the 18th of December, uh, 1967. And here is a shot of the market master negative uh, currently in my garage. Um, the, uh, for those of you who don't know, the master negative is obviously a very precious thing. Uh, it's not scratched like the print we saw earlier, because unless you're some sort of crazy artist, you, you don't put uh, master negatives through a projector. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. There's no um, soundtrack in this tin, uh, but there is an undated, uh, there's several actually undated soundtracks in the archive. Um, so let me just have a quick look at my notes. Excuse me a sec. Ah, yes. So what happened next uh, at the Institute? Well, basically, um, I have, I have a, a, a report here uh, written in 1967, which refers to Flexipede. And I'll just read this highlighted section here in case you can't see it so clearly. Um, it became clear that with the computer techniques currently available, the tedious and time consuming film method that's relating to animation has an overwhelming advantage in respect of cost. Um, so uh, that was that. And unfortunately, basically what that all meant was that the Institute was no longer going to fund any of Tony's research. Um, fair enough. Um, at that point in time, computer animation was all a bit of a faff. And uh, the, the, the ICS was still paying off their loan for Atlas. And so they, they couldn't afford to, to throw money at, at Tony for such projects. And um, I asked Tony, what, uh, what, so, so, so what did Benedict think? Benedict thought it was all marvelous, but um, they parted amicably. They didn't work together again after that. But happily, Tony did go on to have a really enjoyable and very varied 20-year uh, career in the, in the um, animation industry, which by the end of his career was actually an industry. Of course, there was no industry when he actually started. He worked on a wide variety of projects. And um, I just want to read a quote to you now, if you'll just excuse me, rifling through my notes again. <clears throat> oh. Hang on a sec. <laughs> Sorry. I need, a, I need some sort of placeholder graphic here, don't I, while I, while I find my notes. Um, so 
tell me about this. I just wanted to find you this quote because it's absolutely lovely. Um, it's by animation legend John Hallis uh, from, a, from a book on computer animation published in 1974. And um, John ha Hallis uh, says, Tony, an early pioneer in computer animation, had contributed programming to practically all computer made films in Britain. And um, that leads me very nicely on to my next point, uh, which was uh, a problem that Tony and I were having with this documentary of ours about his work. Um, we were trying to, to get the whole archive into one kind of narrative film, short, uh, short film box and uh, things just just weren't fitting. And um, uh, we, we oh, oh, I must tell you that these shots were taken at a film lab in London, nowhere. And I've just got to thank James Holcomb here for, for allowing us to go on this ma amazing journey exploring or Tony's work, actually being able to view these film cans. It was absolutely marvellous to be able to go there. So thank you, James. And um, Eventually, after viewing all these cans, um, Tony and I, we solved our problem. Um, we decided that we weren't going to make a single short film. We were going to make a mixed media project. And uh, this would include photos and listings and correspondence and all sorts of things. And um, uh, it would also include footage by ourselves and archive footage of the archive. And uh, it would all be um, uh, kind of compiled together in in a in a in a form of an ebook, and this was kind of uh, designed to sort of emulate the the experience of walking around the archive in no particular order uh, and taking your time where you wanted to take your time. So uh, this was all this was all going swimmingly until, as as Victoria mentioned, um, Tony did. Uh, pass away rather unexpectedly and uh, he left us at his humanist funeral to the sound of the TARDIS dematerialising but um, uh, uh, happily uh, thanks to his family uh, the, the archive did uh, materialise uh, 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 in my garage um, in, uh, and uh, this is obviously, you know, this is obviously a wonderful thing to, 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 to have this archive. This is a shot of 176 of the, of the films in there. And uh, so, yeah, the archive's got a new home. It's in, it's in my house, um, built in the late 60s, just like the Flexipede. Looks a bit like the Flexipede. That's quite nice, isn't it? And uh, yeah, so that's, of course, all wonderful. Apart from there was one very important element to the archive which was missing and that was Tony and uh, things just haven't been the same without my tour guide uh, basically and to cut a long story short and to coin a Tony phrase uh, the project got stuck in the mud um, but that <clears throat> that was um, uh, until four very uh, uh, kind and generous people came along. David Juice, Bob Hobgood, Victoria Marshall, and Dick Leatherdale, good friend of Tony's. And um, I can't thank these four extremely generous people enough for helping me decipher what's in the archive. And a special thanks to Bob Hopgood for um, the hours he's, of processing time he spent on my naive questions and for compiling things into a language that I can understand so that I can then go on and share Tony's work with as wide an audience as possible. So thank you very much for that. And um, I just want to... Um, play you a quick clip now of Tony talking about his animation career. I thought it kind of kind of might be quite fitting for this seminar and uh, see what see what you think anyway. There's obviously loads of lovely clips of Tony, but it was difficult to choose one. I hope I hope you enjoy this. I think my heroes were people who had done something new on their own and made it uh, sort of carved an, an, a new path through the, through the world. I've progressed in lots of ways, but it's me instead of going sort of straight ahead, <laughs> I've gone all over the place. So that's Tony uh, on his career, his marvellous career, in my opinion. And, um, and finally, I just want to end this uh, with a little story uh, about something that happened um, at the beginning of this year. Um, I was chatting with Victoria, uh, well, emailing to be precise, 
uh, um, we were we were discussing um, the punch cards, the Flexipi punch cards, uh, which are in the archive. And she said, send a few scans. And I did. And then um, <laughs> to my delight, I receive an email from Bob Hopgood, which reads, send them all. So that's the end of my section. And uh, David will be explaining what happened next. So let me stop sharing that and over to you David. Thank you very much let me just set up my, uh, my share. Okay so apart from the fact that it says thank you let me start at the beginning. So um, welcome everyone and thank you very much for coming to hear what we have to say. So Tony had said to Kate this box of cards contains the program that created the film. So what I want to do is to give a flavour of, of our approach to seeing whether it was plausible that we'd found the right programme in that box of cards. Uh, I'll tell the story in chronological order. So there are some things that you've seen and heard already um, that we didn't know when we, when we started this adventure. So there were two starting points. The first was, was the card deck and the second was the, the, the film. I'll talk about the film soundtrack um, at the end of, of my part of the talk. So we found a, a candidate program and data files in the card deck that raised issues about the language it was written in and issues about uh, how the graphical output was, was generated. Um, so Bob Hopgood worked on understanding the program and recreating the animation using modern web technologies such as scalable vector graphics. Uh, and I worked on getting the program to run in some sense, also generating SVG output. Um, SVG, if you haven't come across it, is a web markup language for 2D vector graphics standardized by the World Wide Web Consortium. So the card deck was around uh, 2000 cards. In normal circumstances, i.e. I, in the past, you'd have fed it into a card reader uh, and the computer would have done the rest of the work for you, but we didn't have a card reader. So Kate scanned all of the cards and sent them to Bob, who uh, transcribed the, the contents of the cards. Uh, now, if you're very lucky, then across the top of the cards, um, th there's a convenient transcription of, of the content of the card and you just type that, well, you just type that in. If you're not so lucky, you can't read it or it's not there altogether, in which case you decode the card by looking at what's, uh, uh, looking at the holes in the, in the columns. So from that, um, we came up with a, a potential program, um, but that sort of then gave us some, some issues because arguably the most um, common version of Fortran around at the time, the most standard version was Fortran 4, but there were features in the program that were definitely not in Fortran 4. Uh, for example, um, alphabetic labels at the end of do loops uh, nested begin end blocks and variable scope that clearly was not local and no common blocks to share variables between uh, between sub programs. So there were features that looked more like Algol than, than Fortran and also the routines that were used to, uh, to generate the graphics were, were missing. Um, so the four routines at the bottom there, there was no source code for those in the uh, in the file. So what do we do next? Well, we told Kate, um, you've got the archive, you go on a hunt, find us a Fortran manual. Uh, and she did. So she came up with this, which was a manual for Fortran 5 from the University of London Atlas Computing Service. Uh, and that was really great because we'd never heard of Fortran 5 before. Uh, but Dick Leverdale, uh, in an email book to Bob, confirmed that Fortran 5 was a dialect um, developed at um, the, the London Atlas Centre, uh, and he remembered the, uh, the people, the individuals who'd worked on developing that language and, and its compiler. Uh, and lo and behold, in that manual, we found um, the syntax of do loops, which included alphabetic labels, and we also found that the, the Fortran 5 allowed a block structure to programs that was similar to Algol or, or PR1. So let me just digress um, a moment just to talk about microfilm recorders. 
so the the device on the uh, on the um, uh, the left hand side there is the Atlas SC forty twenty. The device on the right hand side is the Benson Laner. So you can see the the, the SC forty twenty was much bigger than the Benson Laner. And that was in part due to the fact that there was a lot of functionality done in hardware on the SC4020 that was done in software on the Benson Laner. And correspondingly, the, 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 uh, the SC4020 in 1967 was around 86,000 and the Benson Laner was somewhere around 50,000. So quite a price difference as well. Um, that clip, uh, that um, um, photo on, on the right hand side there is taken from uh, a film produced by Cullum Lab in 1967 called Worth a Thousand Words. Uh, so that's almost certainly the, the, the actual device that produced Tony's film. Uh, and that film is on YouTube and it's well worth a watch as an insight into scientific computing and what we would now call scientific visualization as it then was. But how did these things work? Well, at the center of both of them uh, was a cathode ray tube um, with a camera mounted above it. This is, uh, I've only got pictures of the, the 4020, unfortunately. I don't have a, the internals of the, the Benson Laner. But the idea was the same. Um, so you've got a tube down the bottom, uh, a film camera mounted above. There was a semi-silvered mirror in this box uh, and a hard copy camera could be mounted on the side. Um, the camera shutters were permanently open, the enclosure was, was light tight when in use, so effectively whatever was drawn on the CRT um, uh, face would then appear on, was drawn on the film. The tube in the SC4020 was around a metre in length, although it's only actually the bottom part of it was the CRT, uh, there was gubbins above it concerned with character generation, uh, hence the name the, the character on tube. Uh, the first such tube was developed by Convair in 1948, and it was at the heart of the displays used in the US SAGE air defense system. So we'd sorted out what the language was. This was kind of what the hardware device was, but what about the, the graphics? Well, Kate provided us with a vital clue because she kept, she kept pestering us. She kept wondering why was it that when the Flexipede um, encountered the left and right screen boundaries, it condensed into a thick vertical line. Uh, and when Kate pesters you, you actually think there's something of merit here, so you better look into it rather carefully, um, which we duly did. And Bob's memory plus some searching around uh, found a paper by Woody Anderson of Johns Hopkins University in the UAID proceedings for 1970. UAID was essentially the Strong, uh, Stromberg Carlson user group for the film recorder. A Woody's paper included a description of a routine called Vector, uh, and that uh, was included in incorporating an SC4020 package called SCORES, and effect effectively that routine clap uh, clamped X coordinates of lines at, at left and right hand screen boundaries. Uh, and on a, a film recorder, that would generate multiple lines, which would appear as a, a single thick line. So we sent Kate back to the boxes again, and she came back with another wonderful find, which was the Atlas Computer Laboratory SC4020 Plotter Manual. Um, that was written by Paul Nelson, uh, who acknowledged Mary Thomas at Aldermaston as having given him the source of the SC uh, scores routines, uh, and also help from Cullum in preparing the manual. And that manual contained uh, the routines, vector, advanced film, etc., that were used in the in the Flexipede code. So um, there was a um, a sort of, sorry, no, let me, let, let, let me just, let me just di di, um, di digress a moment. So, so there was an issue of how did those Fortran routines get bound into the, the Fortran program? Well, there were no JCL statements suggesting it bound in a library, but we had found some strange looking cards in the deck, which looked like they were binary cards. And it turned out that there, there was actually um, a way of incorporating a pre-compiled program in, into a Fortran program. So how, how did that help? 
Well, Kate then found uh, this note in, in Tony's folder, um, which said that the, the Cullum Benson then the plot had been used. Paul Nelson at Chilton had written routines, uh, and they were written in a dialect of Fortran called Hartran, which was running on the Atlas machine. Hartran wasn't flavour of the month with the London Atlas, um, so it was decided to rewrite the machines in ABL or Atlas Basic language. And it turned out that a, a form of Atlas Basic language could then be incorporated within a, a, a Fortran card deck. And those were the cards that kind of looked like the binary cards. Um, Bob knew the format of, of, uh, of, of the language uh, and the way the format in which it would be incorporated, managed to decode some of the cards uh, and found out and found code that corresponded to this uh, truncation code. So we'd made a bit of progress. But um, there was still a kind of a, um, a desire to actually run the program in some sense. Well, we didn't have a Fortran 5 compiler. So what I did was tr to translate the program into Java, uh, and Java was chosen purely for pragmatic reasons. Um, the graphics subroutines were replaced by methods that just wrote their parameters um, and the name of the routine and parameters into a trace file and we could dump other information there as well, which was useful for debugging and understanding the program. And then from that trace file, I could then generate an SVG document. So the animation was, was frame-based. So in scalable vector graphics, um, the easy way to do that was to effectively generate a group element for each frame. And then within that element were elements that uh, drew the graphics for the frame. So a line element would start from this position uh, and then draw a line to the next position and so on. So each frame was a separate group and initially all the groups were made invisible apart from the first one. And then we had a JavaScript routine that would effectively invoke a function every 1 24th of a second to change the visibility of the next frame to visible and the current one to invisible and hence you you, know, you create the animation. So I'll show you a, a, an early example of that. If you look in this, this area kind of around the, um, the, the bottom left hand corner here and I run this, uh, you can see we've got kind of legs going all over the place there. So there were, there were transcription errors uh, and we found some of errors in the data cards and Bob had to laboriously go back to the card deck uh, and actually do some, some manual um, transcription of the cards uh, before we were reasonably confident we got the errors out. So let me just say um, a little bit about how the, uh, uh, how the Flexipede um, walk was done. So we thought originally that it might be a bit like a, a bicycle motion which can be expressed as a four bar mechanism for which there's an analytical solution. So it kind of looked a, a bit like that, but it wasn't totally that. So after pondering it for quite a while and, and doing some manual execution of code and so on, Bob converted the absolute positions that were in the, uh, the data file that had pre-computed uh, the positions of the Flexipede walk. Uh, and he discovered, uh, so he converted those from absolute positions to positions relative to an anchor joint. Uh, from that, he discovered the kind of basic cycle motion within the, the leg and how the, the, the different legs were related in terms of what position they started at and then they started through. Uh, and each leg would effectively follow, a, uh, the foot would follow this sort of tra trajectory going backwards and then kind of going round in, in part of a circle. Uh, and we had an, another program that was, that was generating those, uh, those positions. So the, the Solipede leap um, was, was sort of done in, in a similar way. So it's a, uh, a calculation. Um, and in this case, the knee position was calculated from, from the joint there and, and from the foot position. Um, but Interestingly, um, it used a, a heuristic of Tony's so, so that the, um, the bones here ex, uh, extend and, and contract rather than being fixed as, as you would expect. And Kate told us that that's a technique known technically as squash and stretch. 
and it's a, com a technique commonly used by animators. And in this case, it was being used to good effect to create the impression of the, of the, the solipede really kicking off for the next, uh, for the next leap. Um, and uh, there seems to be a rule of thumb that the better the animator, the more use they made of, uh, of these sorts of techniques. The, the capture of the, um, the solipede by the flexipede is, is the most complicated part of the, of, the, of the animation. It took us a while studying the program code and then stepping through the animation frame by frame to work out what was, was going on. Uh, and effectively, the, the solipede has to be sucked into the open jaws and, and the leg here has to stretch out so that it can be swallowed. And then the front unit kind of goes through uh, moves forward half a unit, the back end goes back half a unit, uh, and the flexipede has grown in length by a, by a segment. So there were still some issues about how these, how these positions of, of leg and, uh, and, and, and leap, or a walk and leap had been calculated. So we got a much clearer idea of what we might be looking for now. So Kate went back to the folders yet again, uh, and she came up with another box with a, a 20 odd page document that had sketches of the final flexipede, um, outlines of Fortran programs and some of the initial designs. And Kate earlier showed um, some other uh, extracts from, from that document. Um, there was also some, some calculation in there um, which effectively nowadays we call a physics-based um, animation. And um, so it, it was clear that, that Tony had sort of used some calculation to, to get a, a basic structure and then he'd kind of used um, stretch and squeeze then uh, on top of that to, cre to create the, the right effect. So now we were, we were reasonably confident that we'd actually got the, the, the right program. Um, and uh, as, we've, as we've seen already, um, the last run was this, the 7th of October, 1967. And Kate had found the job control card and then and the line printer output from that as, as she showed earlier. And, and that's 50, 53 years ago um, last month. Uh, and one could actually say it is only 53 years ago last month when you consider where um, computing has gone in, in the last 53 years. So, we think it's um, the, the output that we were generating was was roughly the same magnitude as the as the output from from that frame. The, in the final film, there there are some sort of additions of, of additional uh, blank frame frames to get timing rights. So we'd got about the right um, thing, knowing roughly how much um, goes into an output block on on mag tape. So. We had a, a final version, and let me show uh, a couple of bits of, of, of this. So the first one I'm going to show uh, without any sound, and that's the uh, um, the, the flexipede when it first meets the, the solipede. Uh, and the thing to do here is just just look at, at the eye. It starts off as a straight line. Then when this thing comes into view, it's then opened up to this recti uh, rectilinear spiral. And then it closes again. So the, 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 that's kind of there's some really motion in there. The flexibility is saying, hmm, this is interesting, uh, worth exploring further. And lo and behold, see what happens. So the next clip um, does actually um, include some of the soundtrack. So Kate, um, Tony told Kate the soundtrack was created using a squeaky office chair, a garage hoist, a mouth harp and himself gulping. And it was recorded surreptitiously at night in the basement of the medical electronics lab at Bart's hospital, where his friend Hugh Rass Riddle worked onto a Philips reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder um, that was owned by Rass's sister. Uh, and I can only say it's a real shame there wasn't a photographer there to record the scene. Well. Bob's son, Paul Hopgood, did some restoration on the, the soundtrack uh, on the, uh, uh, the kind of version that we got. Uh, and he, he then made that available to us in digital formats. Uh, and some of that restoration was actually enhancing the, the, the volume of the track. So let, let, me, uh, let me run um, this bit of the, the animation. Thank <laughs> you. 
I'm sorry the sound synchronization isn't perfect on that. So my, my computer, when it's running animations and Zoom, um, has trouble. So anyway, we'd now got to uh, the point where it seemed like a good point to stop. Um, so we wrote uh, two papers, one in the, the journal Resurrection, the other one on the Children Computing site. Uh, and in a moment, I will actually put links to those into the into the soundtrack. Uh, sorry, soundtrack into the chat channel. Um, so thank you, and back to Toria. Okay. Thank you, David. Well, that's is that it, Victoria? There's no, no more. I've, I've just got thir thirty seconds. Okay. Okay. So that's the story of how one very imaginative and inventive man took six months to do something no one had ever done before and make a two minute animation using an Atlas supercomputer, a nuclear fusion research laboratory and a squeaky office chair. And how two professors emeritus, one expert in at Atlas programming, one professional animator, a small corner of a research lab and a lot of coffee took a few months last year to do some software archaeology and rediscover an iconic bit of computer history from just over 53 years ago. We thought we'd leave the final words to Tony. When asked what he would like to have been if he hadn't been an animator, he said, I think I'd have liked to have been an explorer, actually. That's one of the things I would have liked to have been. I'm not sure I would have liked to have been an Arctic explorer. That's a bit cold for me, or even a jungle explorer. But I do like the idea of exploring new territories.